Hello and welcome to the book, book launch of Twilight Capitalism. My name is Jess Herdman and I'm the publishing assistant for Fernwood Publishing and I'm really excited to kick off this event. Please do subscribe Hello to Fernwood. Hello and welcome to the book, book launch of Twilight Capitalism. Uh-oh. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Please do subscribe to Fernwood's YouTube channel to know when we have other events or exciting content. So to start off, I would, of course, like to acknowledge that I am calling in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, who's Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, and the Dene people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I recognize my privilege as a settler on this land, and I dedicate myself to working in partnership with Indigenous communities in my location. So our event today is brought to you by Fernwood Publishing. It's also part of Radical League, an international festival of books and authors. You can order a copy of Twilight Capitalism via our website, fernwoodpublishing.ca. I'll be providing links throughout the event. Uh, it's currently 25% off until May 19th at 11.59 Eastern Standard Time. Um, so we'll hop in there today. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. There is a live chat on your screen. Uh, please leave any questions or comments there. There's an opportunity towards the end for speakers to answer any questions that you have. Um, the chat is, of course, being monitored for any racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic comments, which will be deleted. And next, I would like to introduce our speakers. First off is... Murray E. G. Smith. Dr. Smith is a professor of sociology and labor studies at Brock University. He has been active on the socialist left in Canada since the 1970s, participating in a variety of campaigns and progressive movements for social change. And Jonah Butovsky. Uh, Dr. Butovsky is an associate professor of sociology at Brock University. His current research is focused on migrant agricultural workers in Niagara and the representation of public opinion in the press. And um, the, we're excited to have also Tim Hayslip here. Um, Tim comes from a working class background in Canada's Niagara region. A former student of Mary uh, Smith and Jonah Butowski, um, it's a beautiful thing to bring that back together, um, he holds a master's degree in critical sociology from Brock University and will be beginning to pursue a PhD in sociology at Toronto's York University this coming fall. So um, from here, I will hand it over to our moderator, Tim Hayslip. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so we're, what we're going to be doing today is talking about Twilight Capitalism. And without any further ado, I'll begin uh, my, I'll, I'll get their authors in on this and begin them uh, in this conversation. So the first question I have for you guys is, uh, why this book at this point? Why did you title your book Twilight Capitalism? Capitalism is one of those words we hear a lot today, but it's not always clear what's really being referred to. Definitions seem to vary from usage to usage, from speaker to speaker. Uh, what do you mean when you say capitalism, and how does this word twilight relate to this? Can you just explain that? Okay, uh, I think I'll take that one on. Uh, to Please. start this going. First of all, thanks to uh, Fernwood for organizing this event. Thanks to Tim for moderating. Uh, this conversation. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who's registered and who's attending. Uh, you make a very good point, Tim, that there's a lot of confusion about what the very meaning of the word capitalism uh, is about, and uh, also about socialism, by the way. And one of the purposes of our book actually is to clarify uh, what the capitalist system really is, what its, its, its key characteristics are, what its key contradictions are, and why it is prone to uh, severe crises and how this impacts on humanity over time. 
Um, so we have an historical perspective on this. We are followers, of course, of Marx's uh, theoretical understanding, his particular theoretical perspective on what capitalism is. Uh, we don't subscribe to the currently fashionable, in some circles at least, notion that capitalism has somehow uh, died since the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. There are certain libertarians on the right who insist that, you know, they're very critical of Wall Street. They're very critical of the bailouts that occurred back in 2008 and 2009. And they insist on all this government intervention shows that capitalism, the free market is dead. Well, we don't equate the idea of capitalism with the so-called free market. Now, there's an element of truth in that notion that there are capitalism pre creates something we can call free markets. But Marx's under, uh, basic understanding of capitalism is that it's uh, a mode of production fundamentally that is based on particular social relations that are historically specific. Capitalism is very different from preceding pre-capitalist socioeconomic systems such as feudalism or the ancient system of chattel slavery uh, and so on. Uh, but the capitalist system, like those earlier systems that I just referred to, is a class antagonistic system. We have a society that's divided into classes that have different interests and who perform different roles within the socioeconomic system. And that's fundamental, first of all, to our understanding of what capitalism is and its historical specificity. So Marx says that what really distinguishes capitalism from other you know, historically existing uh, class antagonistic social and economic systems is under capitalism, we see uh, something that can be called generalized commodity production. Uh, the great majority of things that are produced to meet human needs take the form of commodities by which Marx following Adam Smith understands uh, the term commodity to mean a product of labor, right, that is sold on the market, that is produced with the express aim of selling it on the market. Now, commodity production has gone on for thousands of years. In pre-capitalist societies, it was a kind of subordinate kind of economic and social form. And the, the small-scale commodity producers that existed in those societies typically did not become very rich. But under capitalism, labor power for the first time becomes a uh, commodity on a very wide scale. Uh, the uh, wage laboring class of uh, workers who are in the employ of capital are systematically exploited. And this is the source of capitalist profits and all other forms of capitalist income. So exploitation, a particular form of exploitation is absolutely fundamental to what capitalism is as we understand it and to its dynamics and its, its evolution. There are other social relations as well. Obviously competition plays a big role under capitalism, much more so than in other previous uh, economic systems where market competition at least uh, is, plays a much, much more modest role. Perhaps military competition and feudalism is more pronounced, for example. Uh, so, I mean, I could go on and on about this as I usually do in my lectures uh, <laughs> to my students. It's hard to summarize the essential features of capitalism in just a few minutes, but those are some of them. And these are some of the foundational points we make. You asked a question about what we mean by twilight as well. And what we mean by twilight is we think that capitalism is now, has now entered a new phase of its historical development in the 21st century. Uh, we also argue in the book that really the system as a whole has been on, in a kind of historical structural crisis for about a century now. But we're now entering once again into a very, very uh, acute phase, phase of systemic or structural crisis of the system. And that is conjoined with other crises that capitalism has given rise to, such as the environmental crisis, the climate emergency. And we're also seeing, uh, you know, uh, an intensification of a crisis of the international system as well, rising international tensions. 
which uh, are both caused by capitalism and further aggravate the crises of capitalism, the economic in the economic term, in a sense. Okay. okay, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, actually, I'm really glad you ended on that note. It leads uh, really well into the next uh, thing I want to ask you about. I'll preface my question with a quote from page eight of Twilight Capitalism. Global capitalism, you write, global capitalism with humanity in tow is now facing a triple crisis. One, a deepening structural contradiction of the capitalist mode of production, one manifested as a multidimensional crisis of valorization, that is to say, a crisis in the production of surplus value, the very lifeblood of the profit system. Two, an acute crisis in international relations stemming from the fact that the global productive forces are bursting the confines of the nation state system, the individual units of which continue to address their gravest problems in primarily national ways. And three, a growing metabolic rift between human civilization and what Marx called the natural conditions of production, the ecological foundations of human sustainability. Together, these three interrelated crises suggest that we have now entered a twilight era of capitalism, one in which humanity will either find the means to create a higher and more rational order of social and economic organization, or in which decaying capitalism will bring about the destruction of human, human civilization. So now to some, this may sound a bit overblown. This isn't the picture that we're, that we're regularly presented with in the media, where we're often told that perhaps we have issues, but they can be addressed, mitigated, dealt with. Um, can you please explain yourselves? And maybe I'll direct this one to Jonah and get him involved first. And if, Murray, if you have anything to add once he's done, feel free to jump in, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Tim. Um, I mean, I understand the premise of your question that maybe things aren't so terrible in the system and maybe they can be improved. But that argument is becoming harder and harder to make. And I mean, there's like a new, a new crisis emerges uh, almost monthly or, you know, definitely on an annual basis. But it's but I mean, I, I can recall when I came to Brock I mean, 15 years ago or so, 20 years ago, you know, that argument could be made. And I remember Murray would be talking about, you know, the, these trends in capitalism, the crisis tendencies, and people would say, well, you know, what, what's that all about? And then we have the crisis of 07, 08. And then we have the long depression that, that follows that. The environmental crisis, I mean, is, is uh, it's a matter of years before the world as we know it uh, changes and, and in a very, very uh, disastrous way, not just the lights turning off, but people suffering through drought and, 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 and famine, flooding and so on. Um, and, and I think that, again, in some ways things look OK. I mean, we, st we still have our you know, we can still watch Netflix. We can still order in food. Things seem somewhat normal. On the other hand, we're sitting here now, you know, on this Skype call. I got a kid behind me, you know, on a school call. I got a kid who's still sleeping because of the dislo partially because of the dislocation of this time. Um, you know, zombies look like people more or less, but you scratch beneath the surface and you see that they're that they're not like us at all. Similarly, capitalism seems to be functioning on a very very superficial way, but. Uh, and Murray writes this in the book. I mean, we wrote different sections uh, and he, he calls capitalism quite brittle, even though it looks permanent on a certain way. In a matter of weeks after the lockdown last March, people were running out of money. You know, we were we were in a crisis, you know, um, that took almost no time. Uh, to occur, so such a so such a system that we can say is, uh, you know, the great success of our time in terms of organizing ourselves in terms of technology and growth and productivity, is really really hard to sustain as uh, uh, as a system with a future. So, in other words, just to summarize, uh, you know, we have crisis upon crisis upon crisis, and. Uh, it's harder and harder to sustain the argument that things can just be tweaked. Um, so so I, I take your premise, and certainly people will still defend the system, but I think it's becoming harder and harder and easier to make the argument 
that this is the twilight phase of the system. Well, <clears throat> can I just add to that a little bit? Uh, yes, yes. Of course, a second to everything that, that Joan has just said, but I, I remember you, you in your question suggesting that it was, you know, like the mass media and sort of the, uh, you might call it the mainstream intelligentsia, mainstream academics and so on, who have this rather complacent view and would, would you know, certainly raise their eyebrows, uh, what, you know, regarding our suggestion that we are facing this triple crisis that we talk about in Twilight Capitalism, in which I originally introduced, by the way, in a book I published two years ago called Invisible Leviathan, uh, Marx's Law of Value in the, in the Twilight of Capitalism. That was published by Brill and Haymarket. Um, so here's, here's the thing, you know, in a certain, one way of looking at that is to say that capitalism combines rational and irrational elements. And you can look at capitalism uh, and marvel at all of the, you know, the, the ra really rapid pace of technological innovation that occurs, <clears throat> continues to occur even what we call uh, a period of capitalist decay or a period of in which capitalism's uh, dynamism seems to be kind of running out, seems to be uh, lagging. Uh, even during these times, we see ongoing technological innovation. That's really one of the characteristics of capitalism, that at the micro level of individual firms and so on, you can have businesses, you can have firms and companies continuing to innovate and to produce you know, a wide array, array of different kinds of products. And this can dazzle uh, the masses of the people in many ways and, and give them some kind of confidence that, that capitalism continues to have a progressive kind of role to play, a progressive mission. And there are hopes, of course, that this capacity of capitalism to unleash scientific and technological discoveries and innovations can, become, can be used as a solution to things like the environmental crisis. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation a few months ago put on a uh, documentary about uh, the uh, ozone crisis, the, you know, that became manifest back in the 1980s and 1990s. And there was a successful international effort to address the ozone, the thinning of the ozone layer, which was, has caused so much worry globally at that time. Um, and that crisis has been more or less overcome. And the, but the end, at the end of it, you know, there's a suggestion, why can't we do the same thing now with the climate crisis? Uh, very good question. But you see, we've known for decades that the climate crisis is getting worse. We've had international conferences. We had the Paris Accords some, what, almost 10 years ago now. What concrete actions have really uh, been implemented to solve these problems in a serious way? What real international effort or coordination has emerged? Uh, I have not seen it, quite frankly. And the experts on the environmental crisis, the climate emergency and so on are saying things are in fact getting worse. Mm -hmm. And if they continue to get worse, if, even if we maintain the status quo or even if we you know, make a few adjustments here and there to cut, cut back on carbon emissions, uh, which is the best we can hope for the, from the powers that be today, it seems, we are on a very, very slippery slope to uh, an existential crisis for all of humanity. So I don't want to hang everyth everything on the environmental crisis, though, because our book is not even primarily about that. We have commentary on this question. We have com political commentary on the crisis in international relations. Our main focus, though, is precisely on what uh, Tim identified earlier, which is the valorization crisis, the crisis in the production of surplus value. Our argument comes down to this, that the, the, the lifeblood of the capitalist system is profit. Shocker, right? <laughs> Capitalists are, pop, are profit seekers first and foremost. And that agenda of profit seeking, as long as we maintain the capitalist system, will be the predominant principle of social and economic organization. And that has some good outcomes. Certainly in the long term, it has some good outcomes in terms of technological innovation and so on, as I mentioned. 
but increasingly it's producing irrational outcomes and it's producing obstacles to solving very serious problems that we're facing globally. The capitalist system, the profit system has become outmoded. It's an anachronism. As our friend Michael Roberts put it in his book, The Long Depression, it's, uh, it's past its shelf life. And uh, we can do better. We must do better. If we don't start seriously considering about replacing this system with a superior form of social and economic organization that does not subordinate everything to generating pro uh, profits for the small number of people who own and monopolize the major means of production and distribution and exchange, the, the major economic assets in the world. If we don't do that and, and, and reorient the whole economic order towards uh, satisfying human needs and solving our collective problems, well, you know, I, I very much fear that we're going to see a collapse of human civilization. And that, and that collapse will produce all kinds of you know, quite predictable results, including increasing uh, tendencies towards wars, towards trying to solve one's own country's problems at the expense of other countries or other regions. And that could lead eventually to a new world war, which could turn thermonuclear. So on top of everything else, we have that to worry about. And yet the, none of this is talked about in the, in the so-called mainstream media or unfortunately by most, uh, most academics. Okay. Um, thank you. And so what you're saying is the situation is dire. It, it's not being, uh, the authorities, those that have the power to change the situation are not addressing it in any sort of comprehensive way or a, really a, a way that uh, has the potential to be successful. And in fact, we're seeing the opposite. So I want to direct a question to Jonah now on the topic of the economic malaise that we've been in. How did the period uh, since the economic crisis of 2008 uh, prepare the response to this? And how did it set us up in this situation that we're now living through? Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. So Murray said earlier that profitability and, you know, and, and, and sur sur surplus value is the lifeblood of the system um and there we have a large section in the in the text where we show over the post-war period there's a, a decline in profitability and that's a quite quite a dense section and i, I want to say before I, I lose the opportunity that josh waterton the third author in the, in the text spent a lot of time on that chapter and there's a lot of work done in it and it's very, very, very you know worth reading when when you get a copy um, so we find this secular trend in the decline in, in in profit rates and we also but we also see a growth in what's called fictitious profit and in other words to put it sort of bluntly the you know the capitalist class comes up with more and more creative or bizarre ways or outlandish ways of restoring profitability and, you know, this was happening in the dot-com bubble of the early 2000s, and you talked about the financial crisis. Well, this, we know, was, was triggered by the, uh, the subprime mortgage crisis, where basically people were given mortgages with, you know, who didn't have the means to pay for them, didn't have a job or, or assets, which, of course, makes no sense from a rational point of view, but then these were sold and as complex uh, financial products. Um, so then we, you know, through this in, in, this infusion of liquidity, tons of money put in the system, we had some semblance of normalcy for a while, but it was just a semblance, right? We had, we had enormous polarization between the rich and the poor. We had more and more people just, you know, a paycheck away from poverty, uh, between a half and, and, and three quarters of the population. In, 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 in the rich countries are one paycheck away from, 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 you know, not being able to make ends meet. So, so you asked me about this period after the financial crisis. Well, it was a period of, again, increased financialization and the growth of these fictitious profits. And I'm just thinking about all the things, you know, and it becomes more and more bizarre. I'm thinking about recently the GameStop 
you know, phenomenon when this 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 outfit that sells video games in a retail format became, you know, a billion dollar company through, you know, Reddit and, and, and pure speculation. Um, you may have heard of this uh, the sandwich shop in New Jersey called Hometown International worth over a hundred million dollars. You may have heard of things called non fungible tokens where people can monetize. Oh, uh, you know, Michael Jordan getting his fifth championship. I don't know if I have that one right. Uh, or the first ever tweet is it worth millions of dollars. So I guess what, you know, what I'm alluding to here is more and more desperate measures to kind of have the semblance of liquidity my, uh, and the semblance of profitability. Just this morning, I was listening to CNBC and one of the mavens was saying that we don't want to pop this bubble now because it will be the poor that suffers. So he's implying that A, that there's a bubble and B, that he's concerned about the poor. And he referred to the poor people having to have frozen vegetables rather than fresh while he can still enjoy fresh. I mean, these things are bizarre, right? They're, 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 in some ways, the, the illusion of a, a well-functioning system uh, is, 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 is so tenuous. Uh, that even the you know the kind of titans of capital admit that this is a bubble that could burst, but we shouldn't bur burst it because of the effect on the poor. I mean, we're living in stranger and stranger times. So anyway, that's probably enough of an answer for now. But there's more in the book. Okay, um, I'll, I'll read again from your book, and then I'll ask you a couple questions here. So. Um, we're hardly the only ones who are talking about this issue, this capitalist malaise issue, this crisis that's unfolding. So quoting from your book, on page 200, you write, yet resistance to the theory that his long profits remain strong. It's quite remarkable that many would-be left critics of capitalism and virtually all of its ardent defenders share significant common ground in their economic theory. They share the view that systemic exploitation of productive that is surplus value generating labor is not the foundation of the capitalist system and the capitalist crises are not indicative of any systemic limit to capitalist production. Instead, economic crisis is viewed as an expression of problems arising in the sphere of circulation and exchange, the market as you call it, uh, and these problems are often exacerbated by poor fiscal or monetary policies. Despite the great diversity of views among neoclassical economists, from Paul Samuelson and Gregory McCall to Austrian libertarians and monetarists, Hayek, Friedman, Orthodox Keynesians, Krugman, uh, Skidelsky, left post Keynesians, Hyman Minsky, Steve Keen, and ostensible Marxists who place problems of realization at the center of their understanding of capitalist crises, like Harvey and Michael, Wein Michael Heinrich. Uh, all events are fo a focus on the sphere of circulation. Um, Murray, how would you explain this focus on circulation? And I don't know if we've explained falling profits to newbies. Perhaps you want to do that as well. Just give a very quick overview of that in the sim most simplistic way possible. Yeah. And explain this focus on circulation, please. Okay. Well, let me begin with, with Marx's uh, theory of profitability. There's, a few things that have to be covered to really clarify some of these issues. One is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and as Joan has also emphasized, uh, profit is, you know, the name of the game under the capitalist system. And Marx argues that uh, the, the profit that counts in the long term, at least, under capitalism, is the kind of profit that actually is rooted in or grounded on what uh, Marx calls surplus value. And surplus value is um, the uh, economic value, or the value of the surplus product that is created by the productive workforce. Uh, it is a result of the exploitation of productive wage labor. And Marx argues that over time, as partly because of the antagonism between capital and wage labor, uh, and partly because, perhaps more importantly, because of the competition between capitals who are trying to outcompete each other and kind of divvying up this pool of surplus value that exists 
economy wide, you know, they're all trying to uh, cut out as large a slice of this as they possibly can for themselves. So they're constantly trying to find ways of reducing their costs of doing business, their costs per unit of output. And the, the typical method for doing that historically has been to try to lower labor costs in particular, to make the capitalist production process at the micro level of the, the level of the of individual firms less and less dependent upon the role of living wage labor. Uh, and this at the micro level makes sense. It's rational from the point of view of capitalist firms because it does enable them to more effectively compete you know, in the marketplace, in the sphere of circulation, um, to uh, grab a larger share or proportion of the social surplus value that's being generated. Um, so really capital intensive firms, for example, that, that uh, have big investments in extremely sophisticated uh, productive technologies, you know, automated systems, robotics, artificial intelligence, all these sorts of things, and have a comparatively small labor force, uh, you know, they're not contributing much surplus value to that collective pool that exists economy-wide, but they're able to claim a larger share of that collective pool of surplus value because of their competitive advantages that accrue from, that flow from um, their technological superiority. And that technological superiority uh, is, is referred to as the uh, composition of capital. Um, the, there is a tendency, Marx says, over time for the composition or the organic composition of capital. It also refers to the value composition of capital to rise over time, which basically means that living labor, living wage labor is being displaced by what is effectively dead labor. It's, it's by labor that's been accumulated in the past, right? The, the capital stock which is made up out of fixed capital of various kinds, machinery, building structures, all sorts of uh, tools and equipment, which become increasingly uh, sophisticated, but also increasingly expensive and a major, more and more, you know, larger and larger share of the capital investment. So as the capital investment goes more and more in that direction, instead of in, into hiring uh, living wage labor, at a system-wide level, this has the effect of reducing the amount of new surplus value being pumped out of the productive workforce uh, relative to the overall investment in, in capital on an economy-wide scale. And this is one of the key elements of what we call the valorization crisis of capitalism. There are other aspects to it as well, the, ten the tendency towards increasing systemic costs associated with, for example, the growth of what Marx calls socially necessary unproductive labor. Uh, another uh, uh, manifestation of this valorization crisis was talked about by Jonah, the proliferation of fictitious capital and fictitious profits. These are profits derived through speculation, for example, in stock markets. We've seen, I mean, just consider what's happened over the last year, right? Uh, with uh, stock markets worldwide, and particularly in the US. The Dow Jones Industrial, at the beginning of 2020, reached an historic high of just over 19,000. Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, just over 19,000. By March, it had collapsed to about, I can't remember the exact figure, but somewhere around 15,000 because of the economic contraction. Uh, and then, of course, we see the big bailouts. We see this tremendous infusion of liquidity into the financial system. We see the Federal Reserve in the U.S. Uh, purchasing all kinds of, of uh, paper assets, essentially, which, you know, soars, you know, which, which shores up the market in a major way. So where did I check this morning to see where the Dow Jones Industrial Average is? It's actually fallen over the last couple of days. <laughs> you know, I, I hadn't realized that. I guess I haven't been paying attention to the news very closely, business news anyway. But uh, I think it had reached around 35,000. And now it's, this morning it's down around 34,000. Hmm. I'll probably about that, I suppose. That's a pretty steep 
fall, but relative to where it was a year ago, I mean, it's over twice the value that it was a year ago. And we know that the, 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 the value of gross domestic product or gross output has not doubled over the past year at all. So there's a complete disconnect between the real economy and this enchanted world of, of financial capital. But, but that enchanted world has allowed a lot of people to become very, very rich over the last year. So we've seen a big growth in the portfolios and wealth of many, many members of the so-called billionaire class. Um, much to the chagrin, I think, of most ordinary working people who can't understand how these guys are getting so rich so fast while, you know, the economy seems to be falling apart all around them. I'm okay. not sure if I answered that the question fully, but... Uh, I, I, you, you did, and you touched on some things that are related. Uh, one of the themes of the book, of course, is that these uh, various crises we face, which are often talked about, as if they're, they're, they're compartmentalized in the discourse, are actually, in fact, quite inter interrelated. And on that note, I'm going to turn to, uh, to guests, to audience questions now. Um, uh, Liz, I won't say full names, just uh, in, in, to, to, prevail, to pre protect anonymity, I'll just go with first names, but Liz and JB asked two questions that are quite related. Liz asks, can you speak more to the international tensions that have been exacerbated during the twilight of capitalism? And JB asks, uh, well, he starts by prefacing, Murray mentioned that the use of twilight refers to an acute phase of late stage capitalism. Could you expand on how this fits into uh, a two part question? Lenin's understanding of imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism and what Lenin saw as the essential task of our time, the need for a revolutionary vanguard party to overthrow capitalism. Does the urgency of the situation change the nature of the test? And those are the two questions quite intimately related, so I asked them together. And I'll, I'll address this to, to Murray if you want, or Jonah if you wish, or wh whoever wishes. I'll let, that, I'll let to, uh, Jonah go first on this. Okay, Jonah, if you want to take a crack at that, we'd appreciate it. And <laughs> I imagine Murray will come in afterwards and, yeah. and add to what you say. <laughs> Well, I'm like, as if we need anything else, another, you know, crisis, you, the first question from Liz was about international tensions. Um, and I, and, you know, in this period of, of, of capitalist crisis, I mean, there's, there's various uh, forms of intense competition between capitalist nations that, that takes place. And, and often that takes place in the form of, you know, cold wars and, and those wars can sometimes heat up. So, you know, we, we've, we've got tensions in various places over, around the world, you know, Russia and Ukraine, in the Middle East, in, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, India, Pakistan. And, you know, uh, this, this is the, the history of capitalism is, 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 you know, during periods of crisis, oftentimes there are these military flare-ups which have the you know the, the resulting in our uh, sort of a restarting of the system in some ways after the the periods of of of, of destruction um but i mean the, you know and, and again we can we can look at uh the the growth of far-right parties and leaders in various parts of the world Brazil, India, uh, as, uh, you know, as in some ways a reaction to the economic dislocation felt by people, particularly among the working class. Um, so, so this is a one other, you know, of the, the very scary parts uh, of, of, of this capitalist crisis. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Murray to, uh, he can add to that and answer the other question from JB. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, that's, that's a large question. We've seen increasing tensions, obviously, between the U.S. and its allies in Russia over the last, uh, really since the Georgia War of 2008, um, but especially since the uh, um, uh, crisis that occurred, political crisis that occurred in 2013-14 in Ukraine. I don't want to get, I, you know, that's, Russia has become a boogeyman um, and has, you know, uh, all sorts of ridiculous 
I think, in my opinion, really ridiculous accusations that have been made against Russia uh, that really don't make any sense if you step back and look at it soberly that, you know, why would Russia do a lot of the things that are attributed, that is attributed to it just because they're, you know, just evil? Because it seems to me that uh, I don't really see any real rewards for them, you know, and pursuing some of the things that have been attributed to them. Uh, but I'll leave that aside. I want to focus more on China because that, that's the really important one. In the long term, this is the biggest issue. China, the rise of China is posing a real threat to the hegemony, to the dominance of U.S. capitalism, U.S. imperialism, if you like. The Americans don't like that. The Americans want to preserve what they call a rules-based order. That, And you can translate that as basically... Uh, a world order, world economic order, where they set the rules, they define the rules, and where those rules invariably are supposed to work in their favor and against other countries. And, you know, China is clearly at the economic level posing a real threat, a real, it's seen as a real competitor and rival, potentially as a contender for you know, the role of being the world's hegemon. And America doesn't like that one little bit. And here in Canada, of course, we're closely aligned, unfortunately, to the United States. And the consequences, we get things like, uh, you know, a resolution passed unanimously in the Canadian Parliament condemning China of uh, carrying out a genocide against the Uyghur minority in northwestern China in Xinjiang. And the despite the fact there's absolutely no solid evidence of that happening uh, uh, happening at all. Um, this has been disputed, refuted very, very effectively in a number of quarters by a number of journalists and scholars. Um, what do the officials base that on, that accusation on? Well, a, a large part of it apparently is based on the supposed scholarship of a guy named Zenz in Germany, who is affiliated with an organization called the um, International Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation or something like that. Uh, he's also an academic associated with an evangelical, fundamentalist evangelical Christian college somewhere in Germany. Much of these claims are based upon what he says his research has found. The research has been refuted very, very effectively by, among other people, Max Blumenthal and Grayson, Gareth Porter, and others, who have meticulously taken it apart. But I want to say something and make a more general point about this. You know, it's really rich, of course, for the for the Americans to be accusing the Chinese. I, I don't, and by the way, I don't dispute the fact that it could be that the Uyghurs. As, a, as, a, as an ethnic minority, as a religious minority in China, you know, have have been at the receiving end of some uh, bad treatment by the central authorities. But to, to characterize this, you know, discrimination, if it has happened, and there probably has been some cases of discrimination happening, to characterize that as genocide is really rich coming from a country like the U.S. where, you know, you have over 2 million people incarcerated in prison and jails. And disproportionately, that prison population is represented in by black people and people, other people of color. Um, it's, it's really rich for the Canadian government to be doing this, given our record with the indigenous population in Canada, our treatment of indigenous peoples, which is not something from the distant past. It's an ongoing and huge problem and which the federal government, despite its rhetoric, even under the liberals, has not done very much about concretely. Um, so hypocrisy aside, though, I want to sort of link this question to a, a larger question about just what is the death toll globally, something we address in chapter one in particular uh, of Twilight Capitalism. What is the death toll from the operations of the capitalist system. What can we pin on the capitalist system worldwide in terms of 
excess deaths. How many people have died prematurely before their time because of things that could have been prevented had it not been for the particular priorities and operations of the capitalist world, of capitalist economic activity? And my estimate is that, you know, about 60 million people or so die every year and about somewhere between a half and two thirds of those people do die prematurely. This idea of excess deaths or premature deaths, of course, is much in discussion now because of the pandemic. And the, que and the question is posed, how many have died from COVID? The official estimates right now are that globally about three, maybe three and a half million have died. But a recent study indicates that it's more like seven million. A recent scholarly uh, study out of the University of Washington. So one of the questions we pose in chapter one is, how come, given the fact that, you know, arguably 30 to 40 million people die from uh, preventable causes every year in the world, how come there is so much hype about the excess death toll resulting simply from the, the COVID pandemic, which has been, let me make it very clear, I think horribly mismanaged and, you know, decisive action should have been taken to, uh, the kind of action taken by the Chinese government back, you know, back in early 2020, that's really the approach that should have been taken internationally because their approach was to eliminate the virus. And they effectively did that both in uh, Hubei province where the first major outbreak uh, occurred and they prevented it from spreading to other parts of China. But once it got into the Western world, the Western capitalist world, it spread like well, it spread like wildfire, and the response was pathetic. Okay, um, I'll ask a couple more questions together as they're related. Um, relating to what you're just saying about the the death toll, frankly, of uh, of the COVID crisis and how it relates to capitalism and the ongoing deaths of capitalism is causing uh tyranny writes well she writes first hi jonah and murray what are the connections between twilight capitalism and the covid19 pandemic you've been touching on that a bit perhaps a little bit more i'll start this with jonah uh and has the pandemic worked to help or hinder the progression of late stage capitalism so i think that's a question about the social relations of production and jaron writes um and i think this is related especially as you, as you start talking about how capitalism, or rather how the COVID crisis is being uh, played out differently in different countries. Jaron writes, is it a global twilight? I think he's referring to the twilight capitalism. Is it a global twilight or a twilight for Western so-called advanced states alongside a new dawn for rapidly growing states outside the, tr the traditional core? Um, I'm going to say one little thing as a way of answering this. I think Jaron, if he looked, he would find that this year, this since last year, has been quite devastating for um, the rapid growth of the states outside the traditional core. But now I'll pass this to Jonah. Well, thanks, uh, Tim. And um, each of these questions is massive, and, and I have to sort of take a deep breath. And I realize we can only touch the surface and uh, well I, I mean I always see on these talk shows that they give a plug for the book so there's lots of stuff in the book yes uh, where we <laughs> uh, and I and I do I do want to talk about you know the I think you're suggesting the the political response that that's come from COVID and you know one thing that we look at is um, is is the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how that uh, erupted uh, last uh, June and went, uh, you know, through the summer. And, you know, the po police abolition and the other movements that kind of come from that. Now, that's not the whole the whole story in terms of the vision of a political reaction that 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 that, that we suggest needs to happen. But that that can clearly be connected to, uh, you know, the economic inequalities and the conditions of you know, black Americans and how they were disproportionately affected by the pandemic, both because of poor medical care and also because of the prevalence of, of you know, comorbidities, which are 
again, syst systematically related to economic position um, on top of, of, of racist uh, policies. Um, so, I mean, you know, we have a system. I think we spent a lot of time talking about how the system is in decline, uh, how we proved to be completely ineffective in dealing with this most recent challenge in the form of COVID. Uh, I just read this morning that there's there were a total of 4,000 uh, cases of COVID in, in, in Vietnam. And that's what we have on a daily basis until recently in Ontario. But the react and but what's really important in the book is that we spend a lot of time talking about this system in its twilight phase, at least in the West. You know, in the more most massive capitalist nations, and we also talk about what needs to happen next. And this is and and you know we we realize that movements like Black Lives Matter. We have no, you know, interest in telling them that the goals of, you know, police abolition are not important. They can be important, but we're interested in, um, you know, a massive movement of the working class to displace and replace the system. And that's uh, and that's the sort of conclusion of, 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 of the of the book where we talk about alternative forms of economic organization. And we sort of rehabilitate the concept of democratic central planning, uh, one that's been discredited, uh, but probably unfairly. And we go into that. We don't think it's going to be easy. It's going to be extremely difficult, extremely difficult. We talked about the stock market, you know, and, our, and the relation, you know, and the financialization of the economy. People like Murray and I, you know, we depend on in some some degree on financial returns, you know, to have a a retirement in the future, you know, sooner for some than others. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is what's so insidious. Even people who despise the system have to operate within the system, at least uh, to a certain extent. So um, that was a version of an answer, but I really wanted to kind of plug the, the end of the book. We're not just talking about the malaise of capitalism. We're talking about an alternative and that we need to be hard-headed and disciplined in our critique of the system in order to create a world where we can be fun and flaky and 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 do all the things that humans really want to do if they had the opportunity. Um, so thank you. Murray, would you like to uh, speak to that? Yeah, I'll try to be brief because I think we're kind of running out of time. We're beginning to. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, just address... Uh, the question about, you know, twilight capitalism is it a global phenomenon or is it specific to the advanced capitalist world, so-called Western world? Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is, of course, that the, the globe, the global economy, global human civilization remains dominated by, and this goes back to an earlier question about imperialism, remains dominated by uh, the imperialist powers. And that is a fairly small club of countries, most of them in you know, we would characterize as West. I mean, the only one I would really say is is imperialist that is not West is, I guess, Japan. My own view is that China is not uh, an imperialist power, uh, not certainly not in the way that uh, Lenin, for example, defines imperialism in his classic work, uh, Imperialism in the Highest Stage of Capitalism. I believe we are still living in the imperialist epic as uh, defined by Lenin, uh, which, you know, if you boil it all down, Lenin is basically arguing that there is a, a small club of fairly, you know, fairly uh, influential, very powerful capitalist uh, countries that are trying, trying systematically to solve their own economic contradictions and crisis tendencies at the expense uh, of other, you know, smaller capitalist countries, but also uh, what in his time was the colonial world and what we might now call the global south or, you know, the neocolonial world or something. We used to call it the third world. Uh, and and that, those phenomena of unequal exchange and systematic pillage of uh, uh, the global south is an ongoing phenomenon, uh, which, uh, you know, is why we have, I think, a, 
a greater amount of militancy in that part of the world still. There seems to be more of an interest in really shaking things up, challenging the world system there. And certainly in Canada um, or uh, many of the other richer capitalist countries. So yeah, we st we're still living in Lenin's, I, I believe, you know, epic of imperialism, which you also, along with Trotsky, call an epic of wars and revolution. Uh, and this is a global thing. But there is an unfortunate tendency, I think, in, including in the global south, to believe that there can be a way forward within capitalism if you, if you just get the major imperialist powers off your back. In other words, you can have your own sort of national, national capitalist forms of development. Even China, which I see as a kind of a hybrid formation in many ways, it's ruled by basically a Stalinist bureaucratic oligarchy that is committed to the uh, old idea of building socialism in one country. Uh, and the latest model is what's called market socialism. It's trying to, inv trying to uh, reconcile or to bring it har some kind of harmony, various capitalist elements with uh, socialist elements or proto-socialist elements. And, you know, you don't hear a peep out of the Chinese leadership about how the problems of humanity as a whole uh, can and should be addressed. They don't call for global socialism. They just say, leave us alone to do our thing. And, you know, we can even help you out by producing a lot of really cheap consumer goods for your working classes, you know, in North America or Europe. That, that, that could even help out with your profitability problems, you know. If you have a profitability problem, one of the things that can contribute to that is class struggle. People, you know, workers demanding higher wages. Well, if we can, we can sell you commodities at a much lower price, maybe that will kind of tap down the militancy of your of the Western working class. An argument can be made, we make it in, in, in the book, actually, that, that in that sense, the, the Stalinist regime in China actually did a big favor to Western imperialism for a few decades with their market reforms. You know, and of course, it's being repaid, repaid with the blackest of ingratitude now, <laughs> with all kinds of vilification, all kinds of accusations of really bad behavior, even genocide. Um, anyway, twilight capitalism is not a new stage of capitalism in that in, in that sense. You know, we're, we're we're talking about a phase in the history of capitalism. We believe that this will either end with the working class overthrowing the system and creating a new one, which Jonah talked about or capitalism will bring down humanity. And without humanity, capitalism can't survive. So either way, it's the end for capitalism. But will it be the end for humanity too, for human civilization? That's the question. Okay, thank you. We are approaching the end of our time. We have less than 10 minutes. I will just ask you two guys if there's any other general comment you want to make especially as it relates to uh, the way forward to socialism. I'll remind you to only take a couple of moments, and at the very end, I'll come back and thank everybody and sign off. So I'll go with you first, Jonah. Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. Uh, well, I mean, when, you know, when I alluded to this idea of democratic central planning a few minutes ago, I mean, to most people listening, uh, it might sound like a strange concept um, because, well, isn't it like, didn't it, you know, it, it involved in this kind of uh, inefficient, uh, dull, uh, gray Soviet era where, you know, you, you had glasses frames without the lenses and all these kind of mismanagement. And, um, and, and, you know, no doubt uh, we're not promoting ex precisely the, you know, the Soviet model, not at all. But I think it's important to realize that the Soviet economy was quite effective at producing what it needed for its people, including, you know, healthcare and and and, and the technology associated with that. Uh, and we also can note that in, you know, contemporary world. Corporations, and this is not my insight. This is a book by uh, uh, called the uh, something. The the two, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I wanted to get it right. Thanks, Marie. Where where basically Walmart functions like a demo, well, not a democratically, but a planned economy, the size of I think the country of, of Switzerland, for instance, 
uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, providing exactly what needs to be sold in terms of, uh, you know, logistics and all this sort of thing. So, I mean, it, in, in, in a way, what we're, what we're promoting is quite, quite distinct from, you know, different from what we have now. But there are elements in history that show that it's possible, and there's elements in our contemporary world that show that a radically different way of organizing the economy and how we live is possible. Um, but we, again, we don't underestimate the challenge ahead. Uh, and what we try to do in these last sections of the book is is try to take some lessons from history and from the you know heroic attempts of others to build socialism to try to take some lessons that can equip us, uh, you know, for, for the task ahead, uh, we, we understanding that it's going to be very, very difficult. Thank you, Jonah. Murray? Yes, uh, I think that, you know, we should emphasize that, uh, that once we get beyond, uh, you know, the sort of general prognosis that we make in the early chapters of the book and the theoretical questions that we address, and really our economic analysis, which uh, is itself very distinctive compared to those of other would-be Marxists. Uh, we do try to connect our analysis to that great question that was posed by Vladimir Lenin back in 1902. Um, what is to be done? I think it's really incumbent upon people who um, criticize the capitalist system especially make the case of the capitalist system as, you know, posing a, an existential threat to the very existence of humanity, that we actually offer some ideas about how to get out of this, how to move forward, how to, to secure the conditions of human, um, not just human progress, but human survival. And uh, that does necessitate a struggle, which is going to be a very difficult struggle against very powerful forces in the contemporary world that will resist this to the very end. This is, and this is the problem. Of course, one of the reasons people don't want to entertain this, the need for this alternative, is they understand that it will be a very wrenching and very difficult process because the billionaire class and, and, and their underlings, <laughs> for that matter, uh, are perfectly capable of using vi really vicious tactics and violence to suppress any serious movement to expropriate capital politically and economically and to replace the capitalist system with, you know, a socialist democracy, which would be responsive to the needs and the desires of the working class majority, which is now, you know, a working class majority on a global scale for the first time in the 21st century. Um, the system is not working for the great mass of humanity. It continues to work for a very small layer of capitalists, less than 1% of the population globally, far less than 1%. Um, the question people have to pose to themselves is, are you going to submit to that? Well, if you submit to that, Yes, you might avoid many of the difficult struggles that will need to be uh, undertaken to displace the capitalist class, to expropriate it, but that's no guarantee you're going to have a nice future. In fact, all the indicators are that if we continue with this system, the situation is going to simply get worse and worse. Um, and we don't have that much time left, frankly. I, I would say just a few decades at best before we reach, you know, a really catastrophic tipping point. So it is time for radical act, revolutionary action, and it's time to be open-minded about looking at reality for what it is, you know. What, what, what are we confronting? What are the problems we have to address, and how can we address them? We don't believe they can be addressed within the framework of capitalism effectively. On the contrary, capitalism is the problem. It's the biggest problem. Okay, so that's that's it. Thank you very much, Murray. Um, in conclusion, uh, I would like to thank uh, Firmwood for hosting us. I'd like to thank Murray and Jonah for asking me to moderate this afternoon. And of course, I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in, whether you're tuning in live or you're tuning in on YouTube after the fact. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Twilight capitalism makes a great contribution to encouraging us not to think about these crises as uh, compartmentalized, completely distinct from one another, having nothing to do with one another. Rather, they feed into and are interrelated to one another. And the book does an excellent job of disclosing these interrelations. And uh, so that's my plug for the book at the very end of this. Uh, it's a very worthwhile read. Please check it out. Thank you very much. And that's that is all, folks. Thank you.